Hi, my name is Lee Markham. I sing tenor with the Heralds of Harmony, a barbershop chorus located in Tampa, Florida. And since we're all under quarantine right now, I thought now would be a great time to chat with some of my fellow Heralds, find out how they got involved with barbershop and why it's great to be a Herald. Enjoy. For those that end up watching this, uh, Bruce here is a fellow tenor with the Heralds of Harmony. Yeah. And uh, I, I know you from uh, some claim to fame, uh, but if you want to start back, where, where did barbershop start for you? Oh, wow. Well, um, as far back as I can recall, uh, I was six years old when uh, my dad uh, won gold with the Suntones. That would have been 1961, I believe, if my math serves me correctly. And, you know, I, I knew dad was all involved in, in, in barbershop uh, in between his, uh, his uh, day, daytime gig at the time when I was small. Uh, of uh, I think he was an electrician at the time, a journeyman of some sort, and uh, so I knew he was involved in singing. And but after that, things got crazier and crazier. And I, I, you know, my sister and I got drugged to Labor Day jamborees down down in Miami and 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 Dade County Auditorium in, in Miami, where the Miami chapter, uh, which Dad was directing on and off during the years, we get drugged down there and stuff. And then uh, you know I began to. I'd sing, my dad would play the ukulele and I'd sing Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly while he strummed the guitar and, and, and began to learn some barbershop songs. And, uh, you know, then I, I basically, I never really got involved in, in a chapter uh, until uh, probably, other than going to shows, I wasn't involved in actually singing uh, in a barbershop chapter until 1980. Four, I believe it was, and I, my a friend and I that I went to church with, um, went started going to chapter meetings and joined the Miamians chorus down there, and uh, went to one district with them which we did poorly at, and uh, uh, was I had sung in front of hundreds of people in church and concerts and all that kind of stuff. When I got on the stage for the first time with a barbershop chorus at district level. I think I might have got half of my work, my notes out. I mean, I was petrified. I was I was scared spitless. How how old was so, this? Huh? How old was this? Uh, I, it was in nineteen eighty four. I would have been. Let's see. I think in my early thirties or something. Okay. Oh, so it was that long before you really got yeah. to that level. I, of went, I went off went off and studied music and, and went to a small little Bible college in Missouri and, and got my music performance degree. And then got into church music full time, and and being involved with with church on Wednesdays and weekends it didn't really leave a whole heck of a lot of time for barber shopping, uh, you know, uh, back then. So I just you know uh, went to shows and when I could and all that. And then in 90, 1984, uh, moved from back to Florida and started going to the Miami chapter. So I got involved there. Never got involved in quartetting for one reason or another, um, but sang with the Miamians for two or three years and then moved to Tennessee in 1991. So, you know, and then got involved uh, in a, a group, uh, Nashville, the Nashville Singers with Todd Wilson. We founded the group. It was not a barbershop group per se, but we did some barbershop arrangements. And uh, so it's just kind of weird. Uh, I mean, you know, and then I moved uh back to Florida three years ago and you know I went to a lot of different chapters not a lot but several and knew right away that if I was going to get highly active in barber shopping it would have to be with with Tony and the Heralds so I mean it was a little bit farther to drive to Miami and the Miami chapter had kind of split and become THX and then something else and I didn't want to get at that point involved in in that so so the heralds was it and i started you know carpooling with uh with uh, gary and lynn and um and then Dwayne fenn uh who was in the bass section uh, before you came on board uh and we just started carpooling and it's been a thing for two and a half years now i guess we're going now on it's two just years. routine now well yeah i mean but it, it's such a great experience so i guess you'd say that to have the heritage in my life with my dad's music and all that. Um, and then to know that I've really have only, I'm only a nine year 
card carrier in the society. Yeah, we, uh, well, I'm sure like a lot of courses do, but we recently, uh, you know, whenever somebody updates their card or another year has gone by, We'll, we'll clap for every year that somebody, right. all right, so-and-so, eight years, so-and-so, okay. 30 years, and everybody tries to clap it in at the same time. And I was surprised mm -hmm. at the small number of years that you've been a card-carrying member. Obviously, you've been around it all your life, but I was like, what? They need to recount that or something? Yeah, it's uh, it's a little strange even when I think about it. Um, yeah. It's kind of how life worked out, you know? Now, your dad, uh, for those that don't know, they're watching, uh, Gene was the uh, tenor of the Sun Tones, and when you were growing up around that, did you have a sense of how, how big they were? Or did you just think, oh, it's my dad singing with his group? Uh, I don't really think in my uh, younger years, and my even my, I guess it wasn't till my, till after I'd gone off to college and they started, you know, they hooked up with Jackie Gleason in Miami and did his show for a number of years. And then they were on Mike Douglas show. And I think, uh, one other talk show. They never made it to the Tonight Show, uh, but uh, it wasn't really until then that uh, he was always gone. I mean, like I, I never remember him being home on the weekends because he was almost always doing doing shows with the quartet. Um, but no, I, I guess I really would have to honestly say I didn't realize how how big they were in the genre uh, until I was an older, like in like a middle aged guy. You know? Right. And you're like, oh, my dad, uh, my dad is something. Everybody, yeah, everybody seems to know him. I always thought he was something. I mean, I always right. thought, I knew he was a phenomenal singer sure. and I knew he was a great guy and people seemed to really like him. But, but to know what he had truly accomplished and the trend setting group that that truly was, uh, you know, in so many areas. No, I didn't realize it till I was in, you know, mid to late twenties, I would say. And your dad never did, was there, were there ever any moments, because you said you got kind of started later, were there ever any moments where he kind of leaned on you to, hey, get more involved in this? Or was he kind of like, do it on your own time if you want to? Well, he, I would have to say that he never really pushed me. He, I was always aware of what was going on in, musically in his life. And he was always happy to communicate all those things with me. And I, I, I tried to be there at as many of those you know, contests or not contests, but uh, shows and uh, events, um, other chapter shows that they were singing in wherever I happened to live at the time, you know, um, a quick story. I know, I know we, we have limited time, but my, a friend of mine that I sang in a gospel quartet with in college, when we were in Missouri and Springfield, Suntones were doing a concert uh, at Kemper Arena in Kansas City. And it was dead of winter. There was snow everywhere. It was like in the teens. And I, I was driving at the time a 67 Dodge Coronet with no heater or defroster. And so, Perfect so, planning. We, so we bundled up, we drove to Kansas city from Springfield. I think it was of a three or four hour trip each way, got up there, saw the show and then proceeded to, to realize that it got really cold on our way home. And so cold, in fact, that, uh, that uh, there was ice on the inside of the glass, you know, so yeah. one of us had to keep scraping ice off the inside of the windshield while the other one drove. So coldest I've ever been, I think, in my whole life, just, just on account of the sun tones. So, yeah, uh, he never really pushed me, Lee. Uh, we became closer and closer uh, friends, you know, uh, uh, the older I got and the older he got. And, and uh, he would call me knowing that I was in music publishing. And he would always call me and say, hey, I got this chord here or this voice leading here. What should I name this note here in this key and all that kind of stuff? Because most of his arrangements that he did for the Sentons was when I was a kid were on this stupid old out of tune player piano with the guts ripped out of it. So, you know, uh, he knew I was highly involved in gospel music. And of course, I, I knew he was highly involved in his genre of barbershop. And we just sort of kind of, Sometimes we collaborate a little bit and sometimes we bounce things off one another and, you know, he did That's his great. thing and I did mine. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned how nice your dad, uh, had, nice your dad was. I know I never, unfortunately got a chance to meet him, but I know, uh, just from seeing everybody's comments online and, and people that I've talked to in the barbershop world, how great a guy he was. Uh, and I know you to be such a nice guy, probably one of the nicest guys that you'll meet in barbershop or meet just in everyday life. Thank and you. I was wondering, I've noticed a lot of barbershoppers just tend to be very nice people. Why do you think 
that is? What what is that common thread among amongst barber shoppers that makes them just kind of a that down to earth, just friendly sort? Well, that's a that's a really good question. I I don't I don't know that that barber shopping is the key to more, more nice people. I people in every walk of life, and um, you know the 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 good guys usually. Uh, the people who are the those who are kind to other people and take time out for other people and try to encourage other people are the people you try to to hang with you know and then but every organization and every company and every genre of music and the people that make make all that up uh, there's good good people who mean well and and who try to treat others with respect and then there's those who really don't really give a flip um, I do think that there is something to be said for uh, musical ensembles or groups uh, of people who spend a lot of time together, uh, especially as a hobby, um, who are sacrificing their time and their resources to make to try to make good music. I think there is something special about that. It not only attracts a certain brand of people, but it 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 also keeps those people you know, together, like sort of like a family, a, a decent family who sometimes disagree with one another. But for the most part, they're working towards that one goal of making good music and sharing it with other people and being a blessing to other people. So I always have looked at that a lot like my my, my friend Jim Henry, you know, he, he, think, he, he looks at his music and barbershopping as a ministry. And that's, I truly share that view. So I, I really love getting to know people love sharing time with people and trying to be an encouragement to people as well. And I always get more encouragement than I give. It seems it's just always the way it is. When I, when I come in a rehearsal and about half the time I'm either tired from work or even when I'm semi-retired, I'm still tired. Uh, and, uh, but even when I come in feeling kind of bad, 99.9% .9 of the time when I leave our Herald's rehearsal, I, I feel rejuvenated. I feel like I've accomplished something, like I've learned something. And I just don't ever want to stop growing. So, you know, musically or personally. So, so yeah. it, it, it does a trick for me. So I don't know if that answered your question. It, it definitely did. Um, well, I got to wrap, uh, wrap this up for time here. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with me. And I love hearing all your, uh, your backstory as well. So thanks, Lee. I got one suggestion for you. Sure. Why don't you have someone interview you? Because I think you would have an interesting story as well. Hey, it's not off the table. It could happen. <laughs> I've been interjecting little stories here and there. So yeah. cool. Well, thank you for doing this. It's a, it's a privilege to spend time with you, even on Zoom. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you tomorrow night at the Zoom meeting. Of course, I'll be there. Okay, thanks buddy. so much. Talk to you soon. Blessings. Bye.